Hello again, I'm Pastor E.B. Welcome to our Fear or Faith podcast, the official podcast of Zion Lutheran Church in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. You can find out more about us at zionalamo.org. This episode contains my sermon for Sunday, May 21st, 2023, based on the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11, entitled, That They May Know You, The Only True God. In his book, entitled Prayer, author Philip Yancey writes, As Jesus once prayed for Peter, now he prays for us. In fact, the New Testament's only glimpse of what Jesus is doing right now depicts him at the right hand of God interceding for us. In three years of active ministry, Jesus changed the moral landscape of the planet. For nearly 2,000 years since, he has been using another tactic, prayer. What Philip Yancey is writing about is the topic of the sermon you're about to hear, which is based on the beginning of Jesus' high priestly prayer, spoken for the benefit of his disciples as he prepares them and the future church for his departure. Jesus prays for his disciples that they would know God, not in a bare intellectual or even sentimental way, but intimately, that they truly, truly would be one. On this day, back in 1844, while standing in the chamber of the Supreme Court with members of Congress looking on, Samuel Morse tapped out the first long-distance telegraph transmission to his partner, Alfred Vail, 40 miles away in Baltimore. This first message was a quotation from the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 23, verse 23. What hath God wrought? The congressman watching surely must have thought they were witnessing a miracle. So just what hath God wrought? A more relevant than the technological advance itself, even for us today, nearly two centuries later, is the phrase Morse chose part of God's blessing of Israel through the pagan prophet Balaam. Such a phrase typified the pious attitude of many of Morse's contemporaries and captured Morse's own Christian faith. As an inventor, Morse saw himself as an instrument of providence. In the King James translation, where the message was likely found, and in most Bible translations, what hath God wrought has an exclamation point. But punctuation symbols didn't enter Morse code until the late 1860s. And so, reflecting the religious ambiguity of the 19th century in America, it was often misquoted as a question. Speaking of piety, punctuation, and providence, here's an actual question which may or may not reflect the religious ambiguity of our century, the 21st century. What is the most basic belief in Christianity? What is the most basic belief in Christianity? I know it's not a trick question. I happened upon this devotion entitled The Most Basic Belief, penned by the late Baptist pastor, Dr. V.C. Grounds. He wrote, Adolf Hitler was dead. Germany was embarking on the overwhelming task of rebuilding itself as a nation. The German theologian Karl Barth had just returned from exile in Switzerland to the University of Bonn. With the noise of cranes and earth movers in the background, Barth began his first lecture to a class of war-weary students. His very first sentence was, I believe in God. I believe in God. Those are also the first words of the Apostles' Creed, and they are an affirmation that is basic to our Christian faith. In fact, That statement is the foundation from which we view all time and eternity. Dr. Grounds goes on to write that that belief is the only solid foundation for rebuilding a nation or for building a life. If we ignore God, the best of human efforts will crumble in the long run and be shown to have no eternal value. We must be sure, however, that the God we believe in is the one true and living God We must believe in the God who has made himself known in the Bible and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. In the third verse of our gospel reading this morning from the 17th chapter of John's account, Jesus said to his heavenly father, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The whole of chapter 17 is known as Jesus' farewell prayer or high priestly prayer. 
It's the longest of Jesus' recorded prayers meant for certain to be overheard by his disciples, but surely is intended for Christians of all, of every age. Jesus utters this prayer aloud for the simple reason that he wants his disciples to hear his communication with the Father. He wants them to hear with their own ears the thoughts that rise to the Father from his heart, thoughts concerning himself, concerning the disciples at his side, and concerning all future believers in all the world. The high priestly prayer of Jesus serves as a fitting conclusion to the upper room discourse of chapters 14 through 16. In verse 1 of chapter 17, John informs us that this prayer is to be understood as a kind of conclusion to the Lord's teaching in the previous chapters 14 through 16. The four chapters known together as Jesus' farewell discourses. Back in chapter 14, Jesus and his 12 disciples were still reclining around the table at the Lord's Supper. And the disciples had grown increasingly troubled by what Jesus was telling them. Things like one of their group would betray him, that he would soon, very soon, be going away. And where he would go, they could not follow. He told them tenderly, but point blank, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Also believe in me. In our gospel reading from last week, also from chapter 14, Jesus tried to comfort and encourage them with these words. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Still, even the thought of being separated from Jesus and abandoned in a hostile world, no matter how remote, was un unnerving. It's at this point, when they're unnerved, that Jesus means for them to hear him pray aloud. Our text picks up where the previous chapter 16 ends with Jesus asking the disciples, do you now believe? Do you now believe? Before explaining, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus continues in chapter 17. When he had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for, the, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus' prayer is a plea for unity among believers, one that calls on God to make a holy people of believers in him through Jesus to do his work in a corrupted and broken world. Their task is no less than a sanctification of the world through the sanctification of Jesus' disciples, a task to be carried out with the help of the Holy Spirit who, while not mentioned directly in chapter 17, was specifically mentioned by Jesus in previous chapters. I should note here that our three-year lectionary, that is our schedule of scripture readings for each Sunday of a given year, divides the 26 verses of chapter 17 into three parts 
over successive years on the seventh Sunday of Easter, which is today, which precedes Pentecost. The part of the prayer in our, t in our text today supposes that the Son has been given authority over all humanity so that all whom the Father gave him may be given eternal life. Another question then, who is being prayed for here? Is it the human race of all time or divinely elected believers? Early tradition opted to retain the ambiguity, not only those who would be saved, but everyone in the world in need of the divine gift of the Father. This is a prayer meant to be heard by members of the believing community. The flesh and the world excluded from the prayer in verses 2 and 9, respectively, are realities to be dealt with by the disciples left behind to carry on Jesus' work without him. Jesus carries this truth further in verse 8. There are three stages of discipleship in this verse. Number one, God gives the message to Jesus. He passes it on to his disciples, and they accept or obey their calling as such. Two, his disciples come to know Jesus' mission as their own. And three, their mission is God's gift to them and is to guide their lives from this point on. The disciples' mission is God's gift to them. Our mission as disciples is God's gift to us to guide our lives from this point on. This is the path we, too, must take as disciples. Belief, acceptance, obedience. God has chosen us, too, in spite of, no, probably because of, our weaknesses, imperfection, and occasional doubt. Jars of clay that we are, each one of us uniquely gifted for the task at hand, the task of his choosing, of God's choosing, not ours. Jesus has obeyed and asked us to do the same, yet this surely doesn't mean that the disciples were models of obedience by any stretch of the imagination. Nor are we on our best day. His first century disciples may have fallen down a few times, but I think we could say pretty much that they were committed. The same should be true of his 21st century disciples as well. Another question. How clearly do we recognize every aspect of Christ's life and ministry as a gift from God to those for whom Jesus is praying? How clearly do we recognize every aspect of Christ's life and ministry as a gift from God to those for whom Jesus is praying? Okay, that's a rhetorical question, but here's a last question to think about for a minute. Why should Jesus, of all people, I mean, he's God, right? Bother to pray anyway, especially if God already knows the outcome of events. Professor Danny Lasky at Loyola University noted in his commentary on John 17 that Luther saw the whole of this prayer as a model and warrant for Christian prayer. Prayer is therefore not optional for believers, for without prayer, faith cannot subsist or endure. Prayer is to consist of three principal parts that we give honor to God in thanksgiving, that we enumerate before God our knowledge of his blessings, and that we place before God our necessities. Luther proclaimed that God is only known, revealed, and glorified in Christ the Son. Further, God is only served, thanked, praised, extolled, and magnified in giving glory to Christ. Luther argued that those who would speculate about the hidden nature of God and claim knowledge of God apart from the mediation of Christ we're dealing only with a God of their own making. The glorification of the Son has but one purpose, to make God known. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, John sees four living creatures and the 24 elders holding up bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for... God, with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made them to be a king, a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Early in the year 15, 1535, Peter Beskendorf, a barber and an old friend of Luther's, asked Luther for suggestions concerning prayer. Luther responded with an open letter titled, How One Should Pray. 
for Master Peter the Barber. In it, Luther writes, it may well be that you may have some tasks which are as good as good or better than prayer, especially in an emergency. There is a saying ascribed to St. Jerome that everything a believer does is prayer and a proverb, he who works faithfully prays twice. This can be said because a believer fears and honors God in his work and remembers the commandment not to wrong anyone or to try to steal, defraud, or cheat. Such thoughts and such faith undoubtedly transform his work into prayer and a sacrifice of praise. Luther continues, On the other hand, it is also true that the work of an unbeliever is outright cursing, and so he who works faithlessly curses twice. While he does his work, his thoughts are occupied with the neglect of God and violation of his law, how to take advantage of his neighbor, how to steal from him and defraud him. What else can such thoughts be but out and out curses against God and man, which makes one's work and effort a double curse by which a man curses himself? In the end, they are, they are beggars and bunglers. It is of such continual prayer that Christ says in Luke chapter 11, pray without ceasing because one must unceasingly guard against sin and wrongdoing, something one cannot do unless one fears God and keeps his commandment in mind. In, psalm, in the first psalm, uh, verses 1 and 2, the author writes, Blessed is he who mediates, or excuse me, blessed is he who meditates upon his law day and night. Jesus' high priestly prayer exemplifies what it means to understand God's sovereign plan and then submit to it through prayer and obedience. When Jesus' disciples unite, are committed and filled with the desire to follow his lead, only then will the world see what God has done. Or, as was tapped out by Samuel Morse 179 years ago, what hath God wrought? Or maybe, what hath God wrought? With an exclamation point on the end. In Jesus' name, amen. This episode is a part of our Fear or Faith podcast, coming to you from Zion Lutheran Church in Alamo, Texas. We live stream our service at 9 a.m. each Sunday, Central Time, on YouTube. So if you're not familiar with us or with the Lutheran Church, I invite you to join us online as we gather to worship our Lord each week. If you're somewhere near the nexus of the Rio Grande Valley universe, the conjunction of Interstates 2 and 69C, we invite you to come and worship with us in person. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you'll find inspiration and encouragement that only through patience and faith, not impatience and fear, can we effectively deal with life's issues with the help of God. You can reach us by email at fearorfaithpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Pastor E.B. saying so long, and God be with you. <laughs>